How is digitalization redefining history? New generations and new technologies pose new questions and call on us to renew our understanding of history. E-commemoration is digital and agile. It is global and multi-perspective. How will the future of history, shaped by algorithms and social media, look like? We connect history and politics and try to make sense of the present by consulting the past. With the commemoration, we want to discuss the opportunities and challenges of digital remembrance. How can digital tools keep historical testimony alive? We want to bring historians, educators, memory workers, digital pioneers and creative minds from all over the world together. This very first e-commemoration convention gives us the opportunity to discuss new perspectives on creative and participatory commemoration. How can technological innovation enable more inclusive perspectives on history? Join us on our conference platform to participate in discussions with renowned speakers, to try out new technologies in our hands-on sessions and to connect with people from across the globe. Welcome to day two of our e-commemoration convention. Today, we explore how interactive technology and serious game open up new perspectives on the past. And we begin with a panel discussion. But we want this to be a truly interactive experience, so please feel free and feel encouraged to submit your questions via the chat on our conference platform or, of course, via email. After the discussion, we will have the unique opportunity to join a live Let's Play session. So you will all get a first-hand experience of the game Swoboda 1945 Liberation and their take on virtual testimony. We're very excited that we can realize these two sessions uh, in cooperation with the Foundation for Digital Games Culture. And um, in particular, I want to welcome Christian Huberts, who leads their project Remembrance with Games. Over to you, Christian. Thank you, Fiona. And from my side, also a warm welcome to all of today's viewers and guests. The Foundation for Digital Games Culture is an ambassador for games and their opportunities. With our initiative Remembrance with Games, we aim to support everyone who wants to tackle the playful exchange of historical knowledge through gaming. This is why we are very happy to cooperate with the Kerber Foundation for this track of the e-commemoration convention. You will see me again later as a player at the Let's Play session. But for now, I'll turn over to our moderator for the morning, Markus Richter. Go ahead, Markus. Hello, good morning and a warm welcome from me too. I'm Markus Richter. I'm your host for the next two hours. And we want to talk about virtual testimony, how interactive technology and serious games open new perspectives on the past. And we'll be talking about that with Jack Gutmann, an artist from Salzburg. Hello and welcome. Hello. With Witt uh, Schisler, professor at the Charles University in Prague and co-founder of the gaming studio Charles Games. Hello and welcome. Hi, thanks for inviting me. And Karen Jungblut, Director Emeritus of the USC Shoah Foundation. Hello and welcome. Hi. And there's you, dear audience. You heard it. You can also have a part in this. You can ask questions in the chat if the platform you are seeing us on has one available or via mail at ecommemoration at Stiftung.de. I want to start with you, Karen. You are an expert in the field of genocide education and digital media here in Germany, and you are currently developing a non-profit organization with focus on these topics. But before that, you worked for many years at the USC Shoah Foundation, which you are a director emeritus of. There you led the creation of the Visual History Archive, a collection of over 50,000 testimonies of eyewitnesses of the Holocaust and other genocides. And that, in turn, led to the project Dimensions in Testimony we want to talk about today. But before we do that, let's have a short look at the trailer. 
The Holocaust is an undeniable and horrific chapter in human history in which six million Jews and countless millions perished in genocide and crimes against humanity during the Second World War. Dimensions and Testimony is a new format of interview by which you can ask your questions of a Holocaust survivor who has videotaped answers to many questions so that the questions that you have will be answered directly, in person, life-size and 3D. What was life like before the war? I had a very happy childhood. I loved to be together with my family. We understand very well the power of conversation between Holocaust survivors and the younger generation. We've seen it in our schools, we've seen it in our universities. That conversation, that moment of dialogue where I ask my question and I get it answered is just a, a, it's magic in the room when that happens. And we wanted to try and find a way to preserve that as best possible. you could elaborate a little further and focus on what the reason behind the decision is to present eyewitness testimony in this form. Interactive, one could say as a virtualized conversation. What is the goal that will be or should be achieved with this? Um, yes, so the idea really started about 10, 11 years ago um, and it became part of a um, project or thinking and research project in the sense of um, obviously we have testimonies collected of survivors uh, since 1994 and um, but what was missing from some of the um, conversations we were having is seeing and the ability for students to be able to ask and continue to ask their questions and with that in mind and creating exhibits an exhibit um, concept creator uh, Heather Mayo Smith was starting to think about how do we continue to preserve the idea or the, the possibility for students to ask questions of a testimony. Now we have narratives, we have the 50,000 testimonies, um, there are two hours it's, um, in average, um, life histories, and we have created a catalog system can use indexing terms to find answers to your questions. But here it was more important that you can phrase your questions the way you want to phrase it, and um, in a way, find a way to ask questions of a testimony. But how do you do that? So these narratives weren't, weren't able to use them for that type of interaction. And so we had to come up with a whole new way of um, question and recording of the answers um, with the survivor. And so that really started the um, Dimensions and Testimony project um, 2010. And we worked with the Institute of Creative Te Technology at USC um, and others um, from natural language um, experts um, and so on to create the concept um, and then develop um, the actual idea of how to do it and installations and creations of it. All right. We'll talk about all the projects now and then come back to the big questions later. With Schisler, you are an assistant professor at, of new media studies at the Charles University in Prague, working at the crossroad of culture and digital media. You are also the co-founder of Charles Games, a studio focusing on developing series video games. Two games have been released, Attentat 1942 and just in August, Svoboda 1945 Liberation. And here we'll also have a short look at the trailer. Když vám před očima zabijou kamaráda, tak na to nikdy nezapomenete. Si, že teta si směla zabalit jen to nejnutější. Kufry nesměly vážit víc než 50 kg a balila je pod dohlem českých vojáků. Zabili je, 
ale já vím dobře, kde jsou ty hroby a kde je zakopali. Vykašlete se na ten průzkum, šetříte si práci. Ta škola dělá ve vesnici zlou krev. Lidi nezajímá to, co bylo před 50 rokama. Lidi zajímá to, co bude zítra. a short look at this game, which is a distinct mix of animation, video game, mechanics and doku fiction, one could say. How was the idea born to tell the story of World War II in this way? What's the ultimate goal here? Well, actually, uh, especially in the Czech Republic, history is often taught as a list of important dates and events, you know, ones like that you kind of memorize and reproduce. And with our games, we really wanted to show the uh, different personal stories behind the big events you know in history and we want to sh also show the kind of polyphony or multi-perspective of history that you can you know that different people of different backgrounds ethnicities uh, and political orientation can have radically different evaluation of the past so what we did we uh, collaborated with uh, professional historians from the uh, institute of um, uh, contemporary history czech academy of sciences and uh, our games are based on uh, historical research and on real testimonies. We also collaborate with Postbellum, which is a um, uh, Czech NGO collecting testimonies of people who lived through the 20th century, including Second World War and, and, the, and the communist dictatorship. And uh, then we kind of constructed with historians, or our historians constructed fictitious characters, but based on real testimonies. And we made a game out of that, where we combine, uh, yeah, like, real interviews where you talk to people and you ask questions and depending how you frame your question and who you talk to, you get a kind of different answers and different evaluation of the past. And we combine that with archival footage, which we got from the National Film Archive and with uh, comics or like graphic novel segments where certain parts of memories are rendered as black and white graphic uh, graphic novel. And the ultimate goal is yet to let, let students or, or, or players, it's, it's for general public, to experience history from different individual perspectives and kind of to learn how to critically evaluate uh, various historical sources and make kind of their own decisions. Mm -hmm. The agency of, of the players and the feeling of the history is a topic we'll be coming back to. But now to Jack Goodman, you're an artist and you want to raise the importance of video games by using them for educational purposes. You are mainly known for your work on Path Out, which is an autobiographical game, a young man escaping the civil war in Syria. And also let's have a short look at that. Hey guys, it's Abdullah. I used to be an average kid. You know, going to school, listening to some music, and of course, playing some video games. Well, lots of video games. Everything changed in Syria when the war started. My home had become a war zone. I wasn't a gamer anymore, but a refugee. And this is the story of my escape. Remember guys, don't get me killed. Combines gameplay elements with videos of yourself, an eyewitness giving testimony. Why did you choose to tell your story, this story, in this specific way? Okay, uh, great question. First, let me unreveal a couple of things that uh, showed in the trailer. Um, I was shown as Abdullah. Yes, that was my name before one year. And I changed it uh, to Jack and I got married. So I became Jack Goodman. So I took the name from my wife. So yes, I'm that the same person in the trailer, um, just with a lot of beard. And uh, the reason uh, we went with, uh, with games, um, there's a personal reason, there's also a team effort. So the personal reason is I grew up with games my whole life. And uh, one of the few kids in Syria that actually 
uh, would be so much into games in the beginnings uh, of my early life. You know, um, I, I had my hands on a game when I was like six and I was one of the lucky kids to do that. So I knew basically what it is, uh, what an effect of a video game can can do to a player. And that is uh, different, uh, different from a movie and a book in the way that you get not to only share a perspective, but to switch the perspective of the player. So the player is in the shoe of the character they're playing, or they are basically in that world. For example, if you're playing a fantasy game, you get to experience something that you might never maybe experience with magic and dragons, dungeons, and so on. So that, that was the main reason uh, my personal reason why I was thinking about a game to tell um, my story of escaping or, or fleeing Syria. So I put the player in the shoe of a refugee where it's a position maybe they, maybe they will never be in in their whole life. And also uh, a way to present uh, many stories of refugees that had to flee their countries. Um, now, I talked why uh, it's something that made sense to me, but actually it is a team effort when I met uh, the people from Causa Creations, who did all the work on the game. So I myself did not uh, do 90% of the, of, the, of the work on the game, but it was the, the concept that, uh, that we tell my story and it was basically my, my entrance into the world of video games. So yeah, I'm not a... I, um, I didn't study in a university or um, my pro the project was supported by any research or anything. So I'm really glad to share the stage with you guys. It's really a pleasure to be able to go on a stage with you. That's, uh, yeah. Anyway. So from just your introduction of yourself and the project, one can learn that it's about the difference between learning facts about history and to very simply put, experience history or get an idea of what it might have felt to be there not really doing it but maybe get an idea and exactly. uh, that's why i want to talk a little about how this translation happened and i want to start with you jack because the story in the game it's not really to the letter your story in a way it's fictionalized and acted one could say why did you do that and when doing that, how did you deceive, uh, decide what to leave in and, and what to leave out and which elements maybe to add? Okay, so um, the main idea to include uh, more than one escape or more than one story in the, in the game is the main idea is not to be selfish about my story and it's only like talk about how I escaped, but also gather what I knew on the way of stories from people that really actually experienced those things that would have like more dramatic stories than I do and bring everything on the table uh, where games can actually allow you to, to, to put that in a narrative because in games you take choices. You say um, you either go right or left and if you go right you have this story and if you go left you have this story while maybe a book is not uh, capable of doing that as much as games as an interactive medium um yeah maybe i got lost in my words uh, what was the second part of the question if i may ask how, 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 how did you decide what to take in and what to leave out and leave um what well basically we wanted to put as much as we can on the table it was the decision of the budget that uh, let a lot of things uh, left out of the game. So the concept was a bit bigger than the game itself. And what it's, there's a difference between what you have and what you have on the table, what you can bring to the table, to, the, to reality. And what we left out uh, got decided from how much budget did we have. That's basically a budget cut. Okay, so purely economical reasons. Exactly. 100%. Okay, we'll talk about that later on, I hope. Sure. Um, but switching to Karen, interactivity is also one of the main goals of the project. And I want to ask here too how it came to be, what, what's in there? How did you record the eyewitnesses? Not in a technical way, but were those real conversations uh, in the systems? And, and then you cut out the real questions. Did you use everything from everyone or did you make dramaturgical decisions to leave some things out because maybe they were too long or too verbose or something like that? Good question. So we interviewed um, each survivor and we have about 45 now um, like that about um, each one for about a week, meaning five days and every day about three to four hours. 
Um, in total, it ranges between 1,000 to 1,800 questions that each individual has been asked. Um, and the testimony that you then interact with um, includes everything and every answer that was given to any question or to every question that was asked. The only um, segments or clips that we uh, don't bring in as, a, as an answer are because there's technical reasons. So it's the same thing. We filmed in usually a um, sound studio, green screen, also with many cameras so that in the future it could be um, become um, sort of a 360 display um, possibility um, also for VR purposes and other uses. Right now you see a 2D stream that you interact with. Um, but the questions that or answers that weren't included or are not included are because of technical reasons, because a plane went over the building and <laughs> there was a noise. And that literally happened a couple of times in the first um, film studio that we're in. Um, or some other you know, technical reasons because uh, somebody walks in or somebody drops something or somebody forgot to turn off their phone, mm -hmm. um, you know, those kinds of things. But yeah. other than that, uh, we weren't editing the narrative and their life histories. And we, you know, we interviewed them really about their entire life um, and went into a depth um, of a narrative or of the biography that um, was also quite unique for them in that sense. Do they differ from the testimonies from the visual history archive because the eyewitnesses themselves were in another situation, a much more technical setup maybe? Um, that's a good question. Um, they, it's a very different experience for sure because the interviews we've done um, in the archive is you know, at people's homes um, in certain ways and we try to obviously do it as as a small crew as possible always. Um, here you have to come into a studio, there's a fairly extensive technical setup, et cetera. But actually what, um, what occurs most of the time, if not all of the time, once survivors start sitting in their chair and we start going into questions and we're um, going into the interview, you can see and oftentimes tell that once they are starting to answer, everything around them kind of leaves and they're in their story. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that kind of takes over. And so in that respect, uh, I think there were similar moments like that, um, but because it's a question answer process, uh, because with each answer, there's a certain pose they have to kind of remember when they stop their answer, they have to remember a certain pose. And so there's other, element part of it that makes it a little more interruptive as an experience for mm -hmm. sure okay with uh, the game uh, your games are when looking at these three projects in a way farthest away from reality the story is fictitious there's animation there's dialogue scenes but these are acted out by actors still the goal is to understand history and uh, when the game begins right at the start of the bet you uh, the game uh, there's a screen saying it's based on archive testimony and real historic events how did you go about translating this real history into your fictitious story yeah that was actually one of the uh, huge challenge of the, of the project uh, and especially we spend a lot of time as historians uh, talking about that because of course like we have uh, you know thousands of testimonies but um, so we are in the beginning deciding might, maybe we can make you know a real game uh, like a, like a game based on real testimonies uh, and, and, and use um, use real people name and everything but then there were like were very like there are narrative and uh, of course like pedagogical problems and, and ethical problems because many of these people uh, are unfortunately not among us the, the testimonies were collected mainly in the 90s mainly in the 90s and in early 2000 so it's actually the if you start a game you see that you that the time when the game is happening is 2001 because that was the time when many of these people were still among us and uh we um decided like if you have a real testimony you simply can't change it so, 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 and and we feel like we would like to make a game where you can ask different questions, which are not recorded during the testimony. You simply can't do that. So we decided that it will be much more kind of clear that we say we'll create like fictionalized characters, and these these characters are typically 
they are like assemblage of two or three real testimonies. But we created a fictitious name, uh, so it's like you know, not so it's kind of ethical, and we kind of communicate directly to the player that this character is, is fiction. It's like it's like our construct, but this is this construct is written by historians based on research and real testimonies, and we try to kind of differentiate in the game what is real and what is our construct. So, for example, when you when, when they talk about real historical figures or real events, we use the archival footage. When they talk about their own personal history, which is constructed, we use the uh, graphic novel segments. That's kind of like a way to kind of make sure, you know, that we, we don't try to hide the constructedness of our, of our story. We kind of emphasize it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and again, uh, I would say it's a, uh, it's uh, actually uh, Espen Arset, uh, theoretic of new media, once labeled our games ludomentary, like you no, know, not not like like if like like historical documentaries, like where you reenact certain events, and we do it in the form of a game. But um, um, I would say again, the the main goal of the game is to kind of understand the different subjective uh, perspectives. And how people, you know, for example, how people felt, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which uh, is, uh, I think, the, the format is 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 is, uh, is suitable for that. But definitely, we don't try to. Like, we, we like to make sure that it's clear what is constructed, what is not. And especially historians were really, uh, they really wanted to make sure that this this kind this this line is not blurred. Hmm. When when going about creating interactive experiences, there are always boundaries or limits to how far the agency of the players or uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the case of the interview project, uh, the questions, the, the questionnaires, um, what, what they can do. How do you set those limits? And I, I guess right now that's, uh, there are technical limitations because you don't have an uh, infinite budget or you have only a finite amount of answers you can put into the systems. But do you think, apart from that agency of the, of the audience should be limited? Or is the ultimate goal to do an open experience where you can do everything? I mean, Karen, maybe you start, yeah. because the interviews, they have a certain topic, but would it be better if, it, if you know the the persons were completely there and you could ask them anything even if it's not related to the topic um so i mean we we started this so we have a particular um purpose and reason of why we do this and why mm -hmm. survivors sitting down and telling their story mm -hmm. um they want to tell their story of what they experienced um and we also have a framing about it it's before and after um, their experience and in, in this particular case it's the holocaust even so we also did um, a couple of we done interviews with the mandarin um, a survivor from the nanjing massacre um, and so there's a particular um, purpose behind it and so you develop obviously question studies about their life and what they experienced and who they are and what they experienced after um, including reflective questions about um, sort of looking back um, and the, the purpose is to kind of for students in the future to be able to interrogate this type of history through a personal narrative. And that's what the technology allows us to do. But the content is the person's story. And, um, and I think the budgetary reasons is maybe it's also there, but I think it's less of, a, of an issue because we interview the people, the real, the real people, let's put it this way. And so a week, even when we started, when I heard it for the first time, my first reaction was, are you crazy? You can't ask a survivor to sit for a week every day, several hours, and really go deeply into their life experience. Um, and so it's just thinking about how much can, you know, can a person do this? What is ethical? How do you go about this? Mm -hmm. All these considerations have to be part of this. Um, and so... Again, sort of the purpose had a particular framing around this. Now, we don't also know all the questions that anybody would ever want to ask. Um, and so the way we started to work also is with focus groups, finding out, well, survivors have been talking to students for many, many, many years. What are the questions students always ask? What are the questions in different states in the United States? What are they in different countries? Do they differ? Um, 
and those kinds. And so we try to collect as many of these, do these focus groups also culturally and locally uh, specifically to then build the script also based on what have students been asking when they had survivor experiences or interactions. And then that's what sort of the basis is of building this type of, let's just say, uh, question catalog that we use for these interviews. And so it has a framing, it has a, a it has boundaries, so to speak. The questions that then students ask are endless. And the system mm -hmm. then allows us to find ways, okay, they're going to get an answer to their question if it was asked. Or are they going to get an answer? I'm sorry, I wasn't asked this question. Can you ask me something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Dick. What what would you say? Would you like to have players in your game infinite agency, free will, so to speak? Um, there's no uh, like doubt that the player shouldn't be limited by anything. However, games are just like any other entertainment or non-entertainment uh, medium you need to have a, a goal like karen already said you, you need to know what is your goal and how to satisfy that goal like how to get to achieve that goal and you have to ask does the game sufficient sufficiently achieve that goal with what it has then you, if you if, if the answer is yes then it doesn't matter what budget you have what matters is the if the functionality of your game works. Like for example, the goal of Path Out was to uh, put someone in in a refugee's shoes and go and do the experience, have some humor. That was important for us that there was some humor to keep it entertaining. Uh, also, not uh, disrespectful, because there's a fine line between jokes and disrespecting uh, a culture or disrespecting a journey, especially when it's so dramatic. Um, so yeah, um, as I said in the beginning there, the player should not be by any means limited. However, you have a budget, you need, you have a goal for that one project. And maybe from that project, you spark a conversation and you can then note down what other players have questions about maybe a future game or a future project you want to do. And this is how you, this is how you sustain your business or your, your project itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, with in in the game uh, Swoboda, you could argue the only real decision the players are making is that which is the game about to have a side of memory or to demolish it. Um, why is it that it feels like there's no real agency, one could say, but also you feel like you're doing the things you're doing. What is this fine line you're walking and why is it that way? Yeah, well, in our game, actually, there is agency, and the, the main agency is that uh, you choose the questions you ask the, you know, the uh, the, the people living in the village uh, who experience the Second War and the expulsions of certain Germans and, and the rise of communism took over. And um, what we knew from the beginning that we, in our game, we don't allow the players to change history and to you know to to experience some counterfactual history so essentially history like happened as it happened like the in, in the game and the only thing you you can like depending on whom you ask and how you frame the question you can get different evaluations of the story or you can get to different layers of the story what happened and maybe you know if, if you're if you're insensitive or if you ask the wrong questions or don't you know have the right clues then it's that there may be like like pieces of the history which are left out or, or pieces of the personal story uh, which they don't want to share with you so there is definitely limitations limitation to players agency and it was clear we didn't want to allow you to consequentially change the story so there are like segments which are called playable memories and i think you will you will see one of these playable memory in um in in the let's play session where you can like replay small segments of the of the people's uh, memory but if you do something like differently than they did uh, they will tell you okay like but i did this and then the story continues in the way that it like, kind of really really happened uh, so that's that's i would say the, the problem of agency was actually quite quite crucial to us because uh, we want to have control yeah, over over how history is presented and also uh, the second problem which is closely connected is the is the issue of selection because like you know when you're constructing any kind of material you have to there's the necessity of selection you have to select from uh, all the testimonies all the possible 
possible uh, possible characters you can meet, you know, in Czechoslovakia in, in the post-war period, you have to select few, and we have like economically we have like eight slots, I would say. So there was a huge, there were huge debates which perspectives to include and which perspectives to leave out. And we wanted to make sure that, of course, we did some decisions, uh, like six historians on team, and that this is the most heated debate was what to include, which memories used for the for the as, as a background, and. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we use uh, memories of um, uh, which are typically marginalized in the public discourse in Czech Republic. For example, so we have memories of Roma people who are talking about the Romani genocide of the war. Or we also included, uh, for example, perspectives of people who uh, kind of actively collaborated with the Nazi regime, because you know those are kind of oftentimes perspectives left out. And they might be very important if you are talking about the nature of a totalitarian regime and the, the, the pressure it put on, on people. This, these perspectives are actually very, we know that in Czech schools, the perspective of people who decided to kind of, kind of like uh, work with the regime are probably the most fruitful for discussions and, and reflection. Mm -hmm. Let's switch perspectives for a moment, because uh, until now we talked about your perspective, the creator's perspective in a way. Which you've been part of a study titled, Can Video Games Change Attitudes Towards History? It that didn't use uh, none of your games, but maybe there were findings you can think uh, of applying to the projects here? Yeah, definitely what uh, the study shown that it actually what you experience in a game matters. Like we do. We have like a laboratory which uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, serious and educational games. And for a long time, we did research on if you know games can be used for uh, enha for for enhancing uh, the learning gains of of players. And the answer after like years of research uh, just kind of like corroborates with international research is yes, games actually, if they are implemented well uh, and meaningfully, in, in teaching in formal environment, they might have a very positive learning effect. Particle in retention that you simply you remember uh, you remember longer, or you uh, your uh, memory loss is uh, is, is, is uh, lesser when you experience the history in a, in a game or in doing some activities like like learning by doing. And we wanted to know if uh, playing games can change your attitude towards the events depicted in the game, and yeah, they can. Particularly if you experience or see these perspectives through uh, through the eyes of individual who went through it, then can really kind of change your evaluation of what you thought about, for example, a topic before. And I think this doesn't apply to games, this applies to any, I would say, personal testimony or you know personal perspective mm -hmm. that we know that, yeah, and the research kind of, uh, uh, the research confirmed that, yeah, if you, if you go through personal experience of someone else, it, it's, it helps you to understand this, this person motivation and the whole kind of situation and circumstances. And these interactive experiences count as that, count as personal experience. Jack, can you corroborate? Do you have maybe feedback from, from your game, from players? Um, players were, majority were positive reactions, but I had, I had like when I, when I, when I went on events and had to present the game, I had like so many reactions, some cried, some laughed, some hugged me. I even met Israelis uh, that I thought I will never meet in my whole life, that I would meet an Israeli person um, because I taught my whole life that this is the enemy, this is the, the you know, the filthy people, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I personally never really believed in all this crap, but uh, when you meet a person that um, you were raised on drawing, um, so basically in school, they told us to draw, to make like a war, a drawing where Syria is winning. And, you know, meeting this person, it was like, ah, oh, I'm a human. You're a human too. We like the same movies, the same games. Amazing. Um, actually, you know, F the war, you know, we just want peace. Like we have the same goal yet. It's like the, the, the closest thing like you're asking about reactions, but this is one of the reactions I had, right? It's it's such an important topic what's happening in the Middle East between the Arab countries and Israel. And the similar the most similar thing to that is North Korea and South Korea. North Korea being the Arab countries with dictatorships all over the place, and South Korea being Israel with you know uh, the democracy and etc. This is the closest thing, closest example I can see. And when I met that Israeli person, 
I felt like, oh my God, I see it from a total different perspective now. And they see my journey as a total different, different perspective. They saw Syrians also as human being like them because they were also told that we are the enemy right but but was that because you met on these conferences or because they played the game they played the game that's mm -hmm. the point they played the game in the game you're not told that you're actually playing a syrian but they when they got to play a syrian that is fleeing their own their own country because of the war because of the dictator they got to understand yo maybe Syrian people don't really want to fight Israel. They just maybe they just maybe want to live their life with their rights. Like this is what was important to me in this game to show is that I'm a human. I didn't choose to be a refugee. I didn't choose to be born in a country. I didn't even choose my own name. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose my religion. As many things I didn't choose in my life. And yet they're the first thing I get judged by. You always get judged by your height by your hair, by your beard, by your skin color, by where you come from. These are the first thing you get judged by in an airport or in a relationship or in whatever. These are the things that should not matter, damn it. You know, excuse my language, but I get a bit emotional about this. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's all right and true, I Thank you. Think. Thank you. Um, Karen, I, I want to ask you. You're in a in a way you have a, a, a direct comparison between um, students talking to a person in per student, students are talking in person and students are talking to a screen, which one could argue is maybe a, a step away from the real experience. But is it, or are, is it exactly the same in their experiences? Oh, it's not the same. There's no question. It's not the same whether you when you talk to screen or you interact with the person on the screen, even when we now talk virtually on Zoom now. I'm sure our conversation would feel very differently if we were sitting in the same room together next to each other kind of thing. So, you know, you can compare that. And for students too, meeting a survivor in real person, you know, in a room and maybe also over Zoom kind of thing is, is a different story than when you interact with a pre-recorded testimony, so to speak. Um, we, we've had looked at it and we've done some studies. Um, and one of the things we noticed is that um, when, the, when the person is in the room and, and uh, students have the ability to talk with survivor directly, um, it is more of an emotional experience because you obviously have a much more emotional intent like you know um, closeness with the person and um, and there's also sort of a bit of a um, let's just say um, fear or being timid of asking the wrong question or asking mm -hmm. a question that might hurt the person and so the curiosity that students might have about the story gets a bit taken aback by that fear of hurting the person of asking Mm -hmm. um, so that's a bit, and then when you, the experience we've had now with our interactive testimonies, um, one of uh, the feedbacks that's really, I would say, is global feedback internationally, so to speak. I've had this feedback in Germany now, we've had in the United States um, in, with different settings, is where students uh, say that they find it interesting because they can now ask questions that they otherwise were afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. And they can pursue certain topics that they weren't sure they could, and that's it's okay to do. And and so they find it in a sense um, more their curiosity gets more, let's just say, um, gets you know gets uh, initiated or triggered a bit more in that sense. Um, and so that was quite interesting. Now, when we heard that at first, I was a little worried, um, thinking okay, how far does that curiosity go? Um, where does it go into respect like disrespectful questions how does how does that going to play out um and so far um we've had maybe one or two incidences where i would say there was questions asked or comments made into the system that one might find troublesome but then these things were picked up by let's just say a class where it happened and then it became a conversation Mm -hmm. where, where where does this how do you deal with this how do you you know how do you ask respectful questions or what questions are okay and what questions are not okay and if they're not okay why are they not okay and so that actually helps also um, get into conversations that you might otherwise never get into we and then i mean 
sorry, as another experience and um, is that what does happen too with audiences that do have the interactive experience is that we have had moments and that happens more often than not where then the audience says thank you to the screen. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Because at the end they felt like, oh my God, I really had a conversation with somebody now. So I have to, you know, I have to thank that person. Mm -hmm. And so that happens quite often at the end, um, where sort of it becomes sort of a feeling of I really did speak with this person. Yeah. So it's really, really an experience. We have a first question from the audience. You can uh, still ask questions to ecommemoration at Körber-Stiftung.de or in the chat. And uh, Nina Wehrmann is asking, is there like an age label? USK here in Germany for your projects, or, or is it developed for a special age group? We were talking about students. That sounds like is it only for school, or is just that was was mainly player? Uh, Karen, maybe you can start, then Jack, then Vit. Um, so the our testimony projects are usually for the school ages where the topic gets um, uh, brought up, and so um, the experience is usually around. Here, I think it's sort of eighth, ninth grade and up, of course. Um, but they are also um, mostly or many times used in museum settings where then you have groups and you have potentially families who come in. Um, and the context around them is, of course, also extremely important so that um, groups and um, students understand what is this person's experience to to begin with, what's the context, what's the Holocaust and all those kinds of things. So that all has to be part of the program. And so I would say, I would sort of answer it this way without saying, you know, you have to be at least five years mm -hmm. old to be able to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Jack? Yeah, um, there is really no restriction on that. Um, the game uh, with its graphics, it attracts uh, gamers from uh, that were born in the 90s uh, and also 80s so it's a grpg japanese rpg uh one of it's a style of one of the first uh, games ever developed uh so there is really not a target group uh but you know if uh, we we were like attracting as much as we can uh so we had people that were seven wouldn't be really interested so much into the game because they want to like you know experience something fun and uh, with a lot of interactions but then you have uh, seventeen-year-olds and above were engaged, like reading and uh, really engaged in the game. So yeah. And you you don't have an official age label? No, I, I mean I'm not sure. I I didn't do that, so <laughs> maybe there is. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, maybe we we'll look it up. Um, Vid, uh, how about your game? Well, both our games have official USK rating, uh, which is twelve plus. Mm -hmm. And actually, Attentat 1942, our, our previous game, which was about the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia, uh, was one of the first games which received US, USK age rating, in, even though the game includes uh, Nazi, Nazi symbolism. Uh, and like it was like, like actually, our game was not not available in Germany for almost a year because of that issue, and it kind of uh, there was a lot of media coverage, and we essentially, uh, yeah, we decided we can't do what other companies are doing, like change our game and remove the unconstitutional, the symbols of unconstitutional movements from our game, because the game is about Nazi atrocities and, you know, we can't remove uh, uh, Nazis from, from that. So finally, I think our game was one among like what I would say stone, which kind of helped to change the, the policy. And now all the games uh, in Germany are judged individually and each game is judged if it contains such symbols what is the manner in which they use it? If it's, like, if it's used in a social adequate way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and we got that. I have a question. I mean, I, I don't yes. live in Germany, uh, but uh, how, it is, how is it when you have to show like a documentary from the past, you know, about Nazis and uh, yeah, how is it? That, that was, that was uh, what the whole discussion uh, before it was allowed in games was about because you were always allowed to do it in a social adequate way in uh -huh. books or TV mm -hmm. or movies, but you weren't uh -huh. allowed in games. Yeah. So there was a big gap and yeah. now that gap has closed. I see. Uh -huh. okay. All right. But but all you, you you were we were now talking and that is something that happens in, in games and interact, interactive experiences quite often that when we talk about which age group is, then we only talk often only talk about from which age on. But 
what's about the other end of the age spectrum? Are you aiming at kids and young adults? Or do you think like real grown-ups, <laughs> it's also for them? Or would have, or let me rephrase this, interactive experience, uh, interactive experience from eyewitness testimony or that can replace eyewitness testimony. Would they have to be in another way than your project? Do we have thoughts on that? I mean, if, if I um, yes. talk from our perspective, um, our well, the mission and the goal for us is to, to document these testimonies and first person's experiences for educational and research purposes. So in that sense, you're already setting sort of a framework for what the purpose and the use of these testimonies, um, you know, is for. Um, and so then it's going to be in programs that speak to education and or research um, in that sense. Um, and we, we know that education, you never stop learning. And um, adults can learn just as much and important information from personal narratives as young children. So from that perspective, I would say there is definitely no end uh, when it comes to age um, and the learning experience. And I'll leave the gaming world to our other two experts. Yes. What would you say with? Well, both our games were originally uh, years ago created as, a, as like educational tools for, for high schools. Uh, and they, they, they came uh, to the high, to high schools for free and with uh, like guidelines for teachers how to how to how to integrate them into into formal education and this this, this the, the, the new versions which are on steam like atentana 942 and, and uh, liberation are actually like uh, we uh really reworked or actually made from scratch we use the material from the educational simulations but we made them from scratch to be more game to be more accessible to global audience uh in also like in you know very informal settings because we we saw that like how many effort and work went into the uh, into the into the games for schools, and we wanted to this kind of um, work be available to to anyone. So, uh, what you can buy on Steam is you know it's like it's it's not necessarily educational. I would say it's more we try to say it's it's a, it's a game uh, with a very strong narrative uh, about about uh, real historical events, and that's kind of and it's for everyone. And we know we have players from all age group, like twelve plus to you know very very like. We have, we have players who are in their 60s and who are uh, writing us feedback. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's really accessible to anyone. Mm -hmm. And we're already nearing the end of this uh, panel. And the title was about open new perspectives on the past. Do you think the things you are doing are like... There, there are like two problems. The one is we, for some historic events, we won't have eyewitnesses anymore in the years to come. So this can be a replacement. But that's one thing. The other thing is, is there, is there like really a new thing which only can happen here with these inter inter interactive experiences? Can those be used to open up new perspectives or are they maybe even the a better or best tool for for like contested parts of history or is it just just another tool to tell about history or to teach about history um the way i perceive this uh, i want to start with uh, answering this question yes, is please. that interactive medium is just like any other medium you got uh, books that talked about history after the prophet Muhammad or Jesus or whoever, and books, and we know that those people don't exist anymore, and we really can't say what really happened. But you know, we kind of say, okay, yeah, it got documented, and the way we got our our history is through words that was written. Um, and how accurate are those words? We can only prove with the science that we have at the moment. Um, so this is how I look at it. Um, books can um, show something; they can share a perspective. Um, music and also share a perspective then you have uh, photos videos and then you have games that contains all four that can basically contain all four i hate to call it games because i call it interactive medium because it can be basically anything games is just the name we we say to have fun when interacting and having fun is games right mm -hmm. but the fact is why do you like cooking or why are you passionate about something is because you interact and you see your effect on the world 
And that's what interactive medium can do. They can use all four narrative. Um, to, uh, they can use all four ways to to uh, say a narrative. Um, that is uh, music, uh, writing and reading, um, videos and pictures. All four in an interactive, um, yeah, medium. So yeah, right. this is how I, how I look at it. If it's history or anything else, it can get. Uh, I think it can get the job done. Mm -hmm. Karen. Um, for us, I mean, the documentation of the actual stories, the content, that's what's important. Um, and in that respect, we also use technology in a sense as a means to the end. And technology changes, as we know, rapidly. And so part of it is if you want to get and um, have testimony in these life histories be able and available for students now and in the future, you have to think about what are the technological advances, what are students using, where are students getting information. And so um, it's about kind of finding that um, platform of being able to reach them also with the tools and in the media or medium that students are comfortable with and um, are of interest to them. And so I think that's how I would answer that question. So the interactive testimonies is another way of reaching students. Um, in with particular topics and, and, you know, information. And I think the other part is the participatory part, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. I think student learning, uh, that is not just I'm listening and I'm listening to a lecture versus here, I can actually find a way of interacting and asking questions. My own, you know, way of thinking could come into it. I think um, it's, more successful. Mm -hmm. We we must be coming to an end now. But I, I'm seeing agreeing you nodding, um, and we have another question from the audience, which I want to use to make a last round with you. And I have to beg for a short answer on this one. And uh, David Rosenthal is asking if you think he's directing it at you, with, but I want to ask all of you if augmented reality would maybe a good thing to to tell history to teach history and i want to make it a little bit broader what do you think in uh, karen you said technology all always at once what do you think is the future what are the next steps in interactivity and teaching history and bit maybe you start now i think mean, augmented reality is actually i think awesome way to teach history because you can very easily you know you can for example walk through a city and you can see like you know, you can you can combine what is there, what still remains there. For example, the buildings and remnants with uh, with reconstructions or or additional layer, digital layer of information. For example, testimonies from the place, etc. Uh, what happened there? So I would say, yeah, definitely augmented reality is definitely uh, interesting way to teach particle history, particle history, and to connect testimonies uh, and information to sites of memory, to the places where where these things happened. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Jack, what do you think is the next step in uh, telling stories in history? Um, I mean, that's a great question, especially with uh, AR involved, because where I'm hired right now, we did just that. Uh, we told the history of uh, the city of Salzburg uh, through augmented reality, where uh, so it's a position based game. It's an escape room in AR and you go through the city and the, 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 the story, the story is basically in 100 years, but mm -hmm. you get to learn about the history of Salzburg through it. Uh, so yeah, you have to go to certain positions and scan, and like uh, there will be some puzzles that say uh, what, because in the future, for example, a statue will be destroyed and they don't know the what's written on it and you have to tell them what's written on it. So it's a communication between you and the possible future and you have to help out uh, so the world doesn't get destroyed. And it so takes place in Salzburg. I don't know what's the, yeah. Yeah. So the next next steps are already in planning. Can, yeah. What about you? What what do you think? About absolutely, I think a um, augmented reality is absolutely a tool. Um, I think it's all about the authenticity of the content, the context, and how you describe it, and um, how you make sure you differentiate between what what is real, what is based on real narratives, and what might be a creative license you took. And, and I think as long as you are clear on that, um, I think these tools are the are tools that um, are worth pursuing. 
mm. even in difficult subject matters as genocide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all three of you, for discussing here and uh, letting us have a look onto your projects. Karen Jungblut, Jack Gutmann, and Witt Schisler, thank you very much. This is it for now, and I'm giving back to Fiona Fritz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing um, experience uh, to hear you talk about uh, the opportunities of interactive technology was uh, truly mind blowing for me. So thank you so much. Um, I just have a few quick uh, announcements. Um, as you're seeing this on our platform, you can learn more about the uh, three projects that were presented here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pointing correctly, but you should see it um, in, the, in the tabs at the very top. Um, just click projects and learn more. And while you're at it, you can explore the platform even further um, take a look at who, who else is participating and maybe you will even find uh, best matches. So people who have um, who share similar interests. So um, I invite you to uh, grab uh, something to drink right now for the next couple of, of minutes and explore the platform and join us again at 11.45 for the next session um, where Marcos uh, will guide us uh, through an experience of uh, Swoboda 1945 and Vichisa, the lead game designer, will join us as well and Christian Huberts will do the gameplay. And um, as augmented reality was mentioned, um, I can already uh, tell you that uh, during this, this afternoon, um, we will take a look at history in extended reality. So we will take a look at virtual reality, but also augmented reality. But for now, grab, grab yourself something to drink and join us at 11.45. Thank you. <laughs>